Good afternoon. This is Yana Benun from Israeli News Live and Denun Institute of Biblical Research. Today we are going to have a little Bible study, but we will start with a testimony of one sister in Christ by name Brenda Jones from Georgia. Uh, yes. She's going to bring us her testimony of her journey coming out of Zionist Christianity. I think Brenda was a Christian for many years, but she believed for a long time that Genesis 12, 3 applies to secular state of Israel and Jewish people in general, that we have to bless Israel. It means today's mm -hmm. land in the Middle East to be blessed and that we have to bless the Jewish people that are racially Jewish to be in order to be blessed. But Brenda came through a journey and of course, um, Holy Spirit has showed her the truth and I would like for her to explain to you what happened to her. Welcome Brenda to our show. Well, thank you, my dear sister. It is so good to be here with you and, and doing this. We've talked about doing it for so long and now we're finally are. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting, and it's such a great joy for me to do this with you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Brenda, you were Christian for many years, a lot longer than me. And Well, yeah. I actually, when I was six years old in a little Baptist church down in Miami, Florida, uh, you'll love this. I don't think I've ever told you this, but, um, you know, in a Baptist church, there was always an altar call at the end of church service. And I felt it in my heart. I knew what I wanted, but I was a little six-year-old, and that church looked so big. And um, when we were driving home from church, I told my mommy that I wanted Jesus in my heart. But I was afraid to go walk down, you know, to the altar call. Well, so mommy, she asked me all kinds of questions to check to see if I fully understood what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And I did. And she said, I tell you what, because like good Baptists, we were always there in the church when the doors were open. So we would go back at Sunday evening. And she said at the Sunday evening service, when they give the altar call, if you still want to go forward, then you just pull on my hand and I'll walk you down there. And that's what we did that night. Okay. And, um, and so I, I, I grew and I, but I, you know, like a lot of people at the end of my um, teens, beginning of my 20s, I shoved God out of the driver's seat of my life. Mm. And I sat down in the driver's seat of my life. And I tried to drive my life for 11 years. And I made a horrible mess out of my life. I be, just, you know, that's all I'm going to say about that. But on the night of my 32nd birthday, um, I, with my husband and I were living in Houston and late that night, about 11 o'clock, I poured a glass of wine. I walked down to the pool, sat down next to the pool with my glass of wine, my feet in the water. And I just confessed to God what I had done over 11 years and how I had just, you know, made a mess of my life. And um, because we're a family friendly show, I won't say exactly what I said to God, but pe when I tell people, they say, Oh, you said that to God. And I said, he's bigger than the universe. He can take it. Yeah. But I looked up to heaven and I said what I did. And I said, you show me what you want me to do and whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do it. I just handed the reins back over to him. And of course, a week and a half later, got pregnant with Jessica. That was one of my two hearts desires. And I got my Bible. Um, I always had um, the Bible that I grew up with, but I could never understand it. Um, I struggled studying Shakespeare when I was in high school. Okay, so we'll just leave it at that. And but when Jessica was seven months old, a new translation had come out. And this new friend, she became very close and she told me about it. And I went, checked it out. I could understand it. Mm -hmm. And um, that was exciting, Jan. I have to, I don't know if I ever told you, but I went with my baby, had washed her up after breakfast, and we went to a Bible store up the street from where we lived in Houston. 
And before I got out of the car, I checked my wallet. We didn't have credit cards back then. And I had like $10 and 70 some six cents in my wallet. And I walked in, I told the lady what I was looking for. She walked me back where the, where the Bibles were. And I found a pocket size Bible in this translation. Mm -hmm. And it was $10. And I knew what I had in my wallet. So I walked up, I paid her for it. And I had got back out to the car with like 26 cents in my wallet. Okay. Went home, fed my Jessica her lunch, put her down for afternoon nap. And I sat down with that little pocket sized Bible. And I just said, God, take me somewhere. And I opened it up. And oh my gosh, his word came alive for me. I could understand what his word said. Yes. And so from that day on, that was in early February of, of 85, I would lay my baby down for her afternoon nap. And instead of doing chores and stuff while she was sleeping, I would go sit down and go, God, take me somewhere. And I would just sit there and just read and read and read. And I never stopped reading. And it's just been an amazing journey you know, what he has told me. And as I told you before we started this, you know, I was reminded this week as we were preparing what P Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter two of second Timothy study to show thyself approved a workman who needeth not to be ashamed of his wages. Sure. And then David wrote in Psalm 119 11, thy word, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you? Yes. And it's been my heart's desire for over 12 years now to get people interested and wanting and willing to sit down, open their Bibles in their lap, like mine's right here, mm -hmm. and read it for themselves. Let the Holy Spirit speak. Because, sister, let me tell you something. In John's gospel in chapter 14 and again in chapter 16 two different times Jesus Christ told them about the fact that he was going to be returning to the father one of the reasons why he was having to go back to the father was because the comforter will come after I go back to the father and then he will a remind you of everything that I've told you and b teach you all things okay yes. we have to be willing to sit down with god's word and let him teach us yes so it was in the process of doing that that i found out the reality of genesis chapter 12 verse 3 and i'm going whoa 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 remember the first time i called you and brother and said guess what i'm finding yeah, <laughs> you were excited. You were excited because uh, as you were studying, Holy Spirit showed you the true meaning yeah. of Genesis 12, 3. Now, here in churches of America, which are mostly Zionist churches, um, out of the pulpits, you hear Genesis 12, 3 read or, or cited to people, and then uh, it is explained in relation to today's nation of Israel, as far as the Jewish state that is now in Middle East. Mm -hmm. So people pick up Israeli flags and wave Israeli flags along with American flags. Mm -hmm. And they often say, that's the first scripture that comes to mind when they are defending why they stand with the state of Israel. And I'm not saying that you cannot stand with Israel. Uh, I personally like every country in the world. I would I, I welcome every single person from any country, be it Scotland, oh. be it Russia, be it Czech Republic, or exactly. Hungary, or Austria, right? It would be interesting to meet all people, and Israel is right there with all these other countries. Right. But, but problem arises, problem is, when we are explaining this verse, Genesis 12, 3, and many pastors and seminaries and theological seminaries today, that's what they're doing, okay? They're explaining Genesis 12, 3 to relate it to the state of Israel. That stands so today as the Jewish state. And then that's the right. Jewish people that live there. 
So right. that, tell that's us like your journey with that particular verse. Pardon me, I'm sorry? Tell, what tell was your us question? your testimony, your journey with Oh, that. okay. Did, did you used to believe that Genesis 12, 3 uh, applies to today's state of Israel? You used to believe that? I used to be, I used to believe that. I mean, I, be, I believe what I had heard, and I'm not going to name names, but there's different ministries that I've listened to, you know, and um, and so I always heard that. And so, yeah, I was all gung-ho about blessing Israel as, as well, and, you know, blessing blessing Netanyahu as well, and, and it was... Yeah. If you've ever heard the saying, I had way back in high school in my senior year, uh, I had one of my high school uh, guys that I went to school with, we were in a debate in U.S. government one day, and he said to me, he said, so basically, you're, you, you believe in my country right or wrong. And way back then, I sat there and I looked at him and I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, here we were, seventeen-year-olds in our in you know, our senior year of high school. And years later, I realized what he was saying about that, and how my thinking back then about my own country mm -hmm. was not exactly correct. Because no, I couldn't be my country right or wrong, you know. Because no, I can't support the things that are wrong. And so that same thing I applied for years to the modern state of Israel, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like my country, right or wrong, you know, right or wrong is my country and I'm, and I'll support it, you yeah, know, right or wrong. It don't matter because God told us we have to bless them. So we are blessed, yeah. right? That's the, so, that's the logic. Yeah. So is that, the truth, though? is that the truth? Yeah. What did the Holy Spirit when do you? When I was sitting here, because I had decided, okay, I want to, I want to study back through Genesis again, because you know I love history, and Genesis is history. But when I was at Genesis chapter twelve, verse three, what I realized was that God was having a private conversation with this guy named Abram. Okay. And, you know, I homeschooled my daughter like you were homeschooling too. And one of the things that I always taught her was, you know, when we're looking at anything, we're studying anything, always ask the five W questions and the one H question. Okay. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Mm -hmm. And I applied that to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 from there and going forward. And what I realized was that, you know what? There's nothing here in this private conversation between God and this guy named Abram about his line that would come years and years and years and years later down through the son that we know of as Isaac. Okay, there's nothing in this verse whatsoever about that. Mm -hmm. There's actually, there's nothing in this verse either about the line of people that would come down through this guy, Abram, through the son that we know of is Ishmael. That's right. All those people came from this one guy named Abram. But what was going on in this conversation between God and this guy, Abram. God was fixing to take Abram into the land of Canaan. What do we know about the land of Canaan? Going back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, there were giants before the flood and after. Mm -hmm. And what I realized as I was studying right here this was simply God saying to this guy named Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm taking you into a land and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. 
this is between me and you. Mm -hmm. Right? This is between me and you. And I went, well, how in the world did anybody ever take this and turn it into this meaning that we're supposed to be blessing the modern nation of Israel? Because then for me, as I was going on into learning about Abram, you know, God in chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram, you know, his name is still Abram. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 16, his name is still Abram. And, but, you know, as decades, decades, years later, when the two angels came and said, guess what? You know, you're going to have a son and, um, you know, it's through this son that, that there's going to be a special blessing. And of course, Sarah, she's going, not my body. That's not going to happen, you know? And she said, here, take my maidservant, please. Which I would never do, but she did it, you know? And so we know that in Genesis chapter 16, Abram fathered a child through Hagar and his name was Ishmael. His name and Abram's name is still Abram, you know, and we keep going, we keep going. And it wasn't until then the covenant of circumcision in chapter 17, then the Lord said, you will be the father of many nations, God said to him. And that's where he said in chapter 17, verse 5, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham because I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. You know, he was establishing with Abram, now named Abraham, this whole history of all these people not just the modern state of Israel. Correct. The whole right. people, Yana. Yes, you know? exactly right. And, and, and we even know, and I'm, I'm trying to find it real fast, but, um, oh, okay. So Isaac didn't come along until chapter 21. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Ishmael, and for a lot of people that don't know, Ishmael was approximately 13 years old when I, Isaac was born. Okay. And, you know, Isaac, he, or Isaac's mom, she goes, she tries to get rid of Hagar when the baby comes and everything. And, you know, and we have Hagar and Ishmael out in the desert. And, um, and, you know, God spoke to, to, um, to Hagar and told him he, to go back, told, told her to go back to Abraham and Sarah and, um, and, and she, and God told her that, uh, that Ishmael was going to be a donkey of a man and would always be at war with all his brothers. Mm-hmm. And that's what's happened down through, you know, when you look at the history of all the nations that came through Ishmael and Isaac, you know, it's always, that's always been that what God told Hagar, this is what's going to happen. It's just, it's, this is how it's going to be, you know? So I'm sitting here and I'm going, you know, if I'm only focused on blessing, quote, the modern state of Israel with the people that are there who we're referring to them as Jews, but I'm not blessing the rest of God's, of Abraham's nations right. that came through him. Um, wait a minute. Um, somebody, a whole group of people getting left out. That's right, because he's a father of many nations. That yeah. it so it's not just Jews, right? It's father of many nations. 
So and that was how I, in my, in my studies, I realized this whole Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. No, 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 no. This is, the, the, it has, once again, some, a group of people have taken one verse out of this whole Holy Bible. They took and it created out of, a theology. Um, yes, they took it out of context. Yeah. The meaning, and they did not, and they forgot to apply it how Apostle Paul explained it as well, because exactly. Apostle Paul did touch on that verse in the New Testament, yeah. uh, to in a letter to Galatians, right? Right, three, in Galatians verse, chapter 3, verse 8. Exactly, he is touching on that, and he's using that scripture, and he is actually applying the promise to the believing Gentiles. Yes. Right, and because the actual promise applies to Abraham's seed, and Apostle Paul explained to us, who is that seed, right? Yes. Yeah, the seed being Jesus Christ. That's so right. the blessing, if you want to apply this verse properly, the blessing applies to those, to, to Jesus Christ himself as the seed, as the promised seed, because the blessing on Abraham, why, why, why God uh, blessed Abraham in the first place? Why? Just because he was Abraham and he had pretty blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever. Mm -hmm. He blessed him because Abraham believed. That's he right. Had faith. He had faith. He believed and God loved it about him. He became his friend. Why? Because he had faith, right? That's and he right. Had faith in a promised seed. Basically, Abraham believed the same gospel we believe now, but he believed it's going to come in the future. And now we believe what already happened, right? That's right. That's right. He was looking forward. He, he was, was looking, looking forward. forward to the promise. And now the right. promise already happened. So we believe on mm -hmm. the same thing Abraham believed. And that's what God loved about Abraham. His faith in a promised seed. Yes. And it was Christ. And now when you are in Christ, Apostle Paul explained, you are Abraham's seed. Seed. That's right. But it doesn't mm. come through your physical genealogy. Mm -mm. It doesn't come through it, your color of your skin or what nation you live in, what country you live in today. But it comes based on the faith that you have in Jesus, in the promised seed. And that was right. so beautifully explained. So to come and take the Genesis 12, 3, take it out of context of the entire scripture and decode it improperly out of the pulpits in Christian churches mm -hmm. is a major problem because this is how false doctrine is born. And now people feel obligated oh, to all we have to, whether it doesn't matter that uh, Israel is bombing Gaza, killing Palestinians, uh, killing Syrians, well, Asking ISIS, it doesn't matter. All of this is just, you know, it don't matter because we have to bless Israel. We have to bless Israel. Okay. Well, and you know, one of the things that when, when you say that, sister, one of the things that has been said for years now by different ones, and again, I don't want to name any names, but, you know, different major evangelical Christian ministries when they give the news and they talk about, you know, the bombing of the Palestinians and, you know, the bombing of, of Gaza and bombing of, and it's like, it's like they're, they're applauding, applauding what the nation of Israel is doing to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to make excuses uh, and teaching Christians wrongly decoded doctrines, because when you have a wrong explanation not within the context of meaning of the scripture mm -hmm. and the, what happens is that basically abuse of scripture happens that's yeah. what happens. it's an abuse and, of scripture and, right. and you know from a from a historical standpoint i can tell you and i know you know this as well but there are all manner of sex s-e-c-t-s that have over the centuries and over the even in the last 200 years have taken a verse or two of scripture and created a whole doctrine from it and 
people that don't sit and study God's holy word themselves, they take what they hear and they believe it and go, well, so-and-so said it, so it must be true. Yes, I'll tell you an example. Uh, every, like sects, you were talking about cults, cults or sects. sects. Yeah. Right. So, and that's exactly right, sister, what, what the leaders of religions and sects and cults, and in this case, even unfortunately, Zionist Christianity, mm-hmm. what they have done, uh, like similar to what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing, okay? I know because I came from that background. Oh, that's right, yeah. And I was converting, converted in August 2010. It was a grace of Jesus Christ that Holy Spirit um, came to me. You know, I was, uh-huh. Jesus came to me and it wasn't a person that I saw. It was just the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that uh-huh. warms, warms like a blanket around me. But I finally, my eyes were opened and I said, Jesus, is this you? You know, even, awesome? even though he wasn't physically there. Yeah, he, I know what you're saying though. I you know. know. To put it to words. And a joy that came over me and my eyes came open that all I ever needed was him. That's all I needed was him. I didn't need elders. I didn't need Watchtower organization. I didn't need leaders in Brooklyn writing to me what Bible means. I needed Holy Spirit. I needed Holy Spirit and open the Bible and show me who Jesus is. Because Jesus said that's what he will do. That's what the Holy Spirit, that's part of... Yes. That's part of his job description, if you will. Okay. That's what I experienced. So let me give you an example. What Jehovah's Witness do similar to what Zionist Christian leaders did in, with a Genesis 12, 3. When Jesus says, and I also have the other sheep that I will also bring, right? Well, who are these other sheep, right? They have this 144,000 doctrine that only 144,000 go to heaven and oh, that's the, rest right. them, heard... the rest of them are going to be on earth, right? Uh, yeah, they will be in a 1,000 millennial reign with, with Christ and Christ will never be here on earth, by the way. He's from heaven, but there will be elders here who are going to direct uh, everything. And they are applying the verse that Jesus said, and I also have these other sheep that are not of this fold, and I also might, might bring them. So they're saying he, they're applying the, the revelation verse of 144,000 to this verse. They tie these two verses together to persuade their flock that there is two groups of people, meaning the one that is going to heaven, okay, that's his up study with his apostles and 144,000. Uh, and then the other group that will be earthly group that will stay here on earth. And you know, you have these men in suits, right? Explaining this Bible to you. And people have a tendency to obey authority. Yeah. The men in suits and say, they must know. Who am I? I know nothing. They know. And Bible right, yeah. does say that. I mean, yeah, Jesus did say that. And yeah, it says 144. So people make this connection and they give their trust to the men. How yeah. they interpret the Bible. But they don't go by themselves to the scripture and they don't ask Holy Spirit to come help them and teach them. And then they parrot every the wrong doctrine. Yep. Yeah. You know, and then you are a slave to this type of doctrine. So that's the same thing with Genesis 12 3. You know what I wanted to do for people also? Because you, how long you were a Zionist Christian, sister? Because I think that you're transformation came <laughs> recently was it like two years ago or three years ago it was just a few years ago i guess i should tell the little story about how it, this is january of 2021 well eight years ago this month i was in a conversation online with a guy and he got livid with me and he accused me of being a zionist and I, I was sitting here and I'm going, what in the world is a Zionist? I'd never even heard the term. I didn't know what it was. And so I was, I was absolutely sure that because I had never heard that before, that word, and I didn't know what it was, then I, I was absolutely sure that it, I wasn't. 
<laughs> what he was accusing me right. of being. <laughs> right. And I, and, and he was very, mm -hmm. very abusive verbally oh. in what he said to me. And my hurt self, I kind of responded almost in kind back to him. <laughs> and so it was only about mm, four years ago that I started learning about the word Zionist mm -hmm. and what Zion, you know, Zionism was and how Christians are are so supportive of the Zionist cause and everything. And I, one day I was sitting back and I'm going, oh, oh my word, that guy way back then, he was right. <laughs> I am a Zionist. Right. I have been a Zionist. Oh my gosh. And of course, by, by then, you know, I don't even know what the guy's name was, where he was. There's no way I could go back and say, I'm so sorry. You were right. I'm so sorry. I took a pen, said mean things back at you, you know? And, um, so yeah, it, it was, um, it was a shock for me to find out that, yeah, I, I had unknowingly bought into that whole narrative. Yes. And, um you know, I'm, I'm Israel as, you know, the kind of like the, you know, my country right or wrong type thing. Like, you know, my classmate accused me of decades before about our country, you know, that I had, I had bought into it mm -hmm. and that that was, no, I needed to, tr I needed to walk away from that. I, well, needed I have a few questions for you. Do you think that the state we are in today as Christians, the place we found ourselves in, in, in uh, right where we are, you know, after everything that happened in 2020, after Trump, after looking at the world situation, do you think that this Zionist Schofieldism, Darby Schofield futuristic uh, theology and Christians in the West supporting this for over 100 years now, do you think it has anything to do with declining Christianity? I actually believe yes. Mm -hmm. And there's something that I'm wanting to say, and I don't know if I should say it right try here. To, try to think of ways how to say it here. I know. <laughs> That's very difficult. And I, I, but there, 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 there is a, and I, there is a, um, there is a thing about, us Christians being taken out of the world that I honestly don't know if that particular line of, of teaching is part of the Schofield Zionist thing. Mm -hmm. However, w one of the things that I have had to really struggle with with all of this in talking with people that I personally know is me saying, well, you know, we have brothers and sisters all over the world yeah. who are suffering the most severe persecution and have been suffering the most severe persecution and being killed, being yeah. executed and everything. So how is it that we Christians here in the West somehow are better than our brothers and sisters all around the rest of the world to where we're not going to have to suffer? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. I, I do. Now, I know the subject you're going to. But I want to stay with Genesis 12.3 and yeah. maybe, we can, maybe we can do the other subject some other time. Another time. Another yeah. time. Right. Because, uh, you know, I want people to focus on, 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 on one thing. You know how people's minds are that they can't do two things at once. I'm getting there. I used to be good in multitasking and I'm no longer. Okay. Good. Just as I've told you before, don't embrace that vile three-letter word that starts with O ends with D and has the L in between, okay? We don't embrace that. That's a nasty three-letter word. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, um, what, what I was kind of trying to explain to people, like Steve and Ivy used to be, I mean, huge Zionists. I mean, we, we, we were having Facebook unconditionally we stand with Israel, okay? Meaning no matter what Israel does or says or what happens, doesn't matter. We stand with Israel. Why? Genesis 12, 3. Yeah. If you want to be blessed, you must stand with Israel, right? So uh, uh, we were there. So we understand how it can happen that you are brainwashed, right? But thank to the Holy Spirit, thank to grace of the Lord, that he showed us that this was wrong and we made changes and came out of that movement to, mm -hmm. to true way of Jesus Christ. But we spent a lot of time in Israel, okay? And we have I a remember. lot of, yeah. yeah, we have a lot of brothers and sisters in Israel. They're, they're mm -hmm. in Palestine, in, in Gaza, West Bank. Mm -hmm. And I have tremendous amount of regrets. And I have to confess to these regrets and my uh, basically repentance over the fact that we have visited the Jewish people. We have financially helped the Jewish people who, would, who did not believe in Jesus Christ as a Messiah. In fact, they had a very mm -hmm. anti-Jesus attitude. And we helped them and uh, visited them and were among them only for one reason, that they are Jews and because we are taught to love Israel. And the idea was that Palestinians have to move out of the land and give place for the Jews in, in order to fulfill prophecy. We yeah. did not pay attention to the ones suffering. Okay. That is very, very true. Yeah. And that, that is a, that is a big problem within the evangelical Christianity here in the West. Right. We, we try to preach Jesus to them, but then, of course, in Israel, you, it's illegal to cross a line, right. okay? So you have to be very careful. They will throw you out. But we did. We did. And we actually had some success, and some Orthodox Jews were following Steve and wanted to know more about Jesus, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But we have not visited the ones that were suffering and the ones that were oppressed. Yeah. We had... People in Gaza, they're Christian brothers and sisters. Their houses were bulldozed, okay? They're living on the literally apartheid system, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have not, I wish if I could redo the whole thing, I would yeah. go there and I would visit them and I would bring them gifts, okay? And I would help my brothers and sisters there. And this is my regret sister that i have and i will always have that regret because when i came from if we came from israel to united states and we did not go back and we don't want to go back but um that is when we found out about everything what's going on yeah. and so i won't have this opportunity and the only thing i can do is is speak up for them right now yeah. So I would encourage all the people who are still going to Israel, if you are a brother and sister in Christ, that you visit the ones that are oppressed over there, okay? The ones that are thrown out of the land, the ones that their houses are taken or bulldozed down, the ones that don't have the same rights as the other Israelis. Mm -hmm. And if you can help them out and you can show love to them, because Jesus would help the oppressed. And all of these attitude of Christians in America, exactly. helping, you know, is from wrongly decoding the Bible and right. wrongly decoding our prophets, okay, from the evangelical churches in America. So, yes. you know, Sister, what I was wanting to invite you, let's read to people these passages of the Bible we are talking about. Absolutely. Let's do it, sister. Let's do well, it. Let's go. So you are, you are at Genesis 12, 3. Let's see. This is the scripture that is often cited and uh, defended in order for us to bless Jewish state. Do, do you remember, sister, though, these types of uh, sermons when people said that these hurricanes that came, 
happened when Obama did not help Israel and God was so angry that he sent hurricane and that God is going to... Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, in I fact, mean... remember when um, I think it was Netanyahu came here and Obama wouldn't talk to him. And like even on Facebook, you can see bukus of people that were changing their Facebook picture to the Israeli flag. Do you remember that? I, I mean, like, remember. Yeah, that's how they were supporting, the, wanting to show on Facebook their support for Israel changing. I didn't do that part. I, I didn't go there, but, you know, <laughs> I was almost there, but I didn't go there back then. Yeah, yeah. but remember how uh, preachers were preaching that, oh, this catastrophe happened in the United States and big winds and hurricanes and floods, and it's all because we don't support Israel enough, and God is yeah. going to be angry and destroy us because we yeah, are... They were. Israel. So all of these things is manipulation of people's psyche. That's right. So, and they're psyops. They're psyops and manipulation of, of people's minds. That's right. Okay, it's called it's part of the brainwashing system. Okay. Mm -hmm. The God is some kind of an angry, angry God sitting up there on the clouds looking at you whether you're going to raise the Israeli flag and wave it or not. I mean, can you really believe it? Entire scripture is about Jesus. Jesus said that. <laughs> Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you knew Moses, you would love me because yeah. he wrote of me. That's this right. The book of Genesis. Jesus said that entire prophets are about him. It's all about That's right. him. That's he's, right. He's the message. If you want to say one word out of the whole message of the Bible, it's Jesus. Because it's there all about him. That's so, it. you know, it's not about Jewish state and, and uh, <laughs> but anyway, sister, let's read that. Go ahead. It's Genesis 12, 3. That's the actual scripture. Yes. And this is where we see here the Lord speaking to Abram. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you yes well very good but now let's go to galatians 3 8 right because i was fixing to say i have in my, the margin of my bible here galatians 3 8 that i wrote decades ago wow. and and a little note that says the gospel to the gentiles so let's look at what was said in galatians 3 8 because that's what this is what god was talking about the gospel to the Gentiles. Exactly, to the nations, nations, yeah. you know, the Gentiles, yeah. you know, because it says all nations through you will be blessed. Well, the nations is Gentiles, and it says here 3 8 Galatians and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we see? That Apostle Paul said the gospel was already preached to Abraham. Who preached it? God. God did. He said that all the nations will be blessed through you. Yes. Through your faith, Through your seed, which is Christ. That's mm -hmm. the gospel, people. Abraham knew the gospel as we know it today. Yes. And, and, and Apostle Paul, Galatians 3.8, is citing Genesis 12.3 and applying it. That's right. Believe right. in Gentiles, okay? The, those who believed on Jesus Christ. And it does, did start with Jews, believing Jews. And there is no longer Jew or Gentile. Walls of partition are gone. Because That's right. Because you are in Christ. You are one. You are one nation. You are one church. You are one people of God. There is no Jews and Gentiles. But if you go back into Zionistic views and Schofield views, the walls of partition comes back up again and we have Jews and we have Gentiles and different things apply to Jews different things to Gentiles and now that's basically they're dismantling the whole gospel and people don't even know how they get get there but they got there through brainwashing from the pulpits right you know the thought has just occurred to me sister 
Hebrews chapter 13, we know the, that chapter as the Hall of Faith, F-A-I-T-H. And as you were just now saying that, I thought again to Hebrews chapter 13, because one of the things that I have for years enjoyed about going and reading through the Hebrews chapter 13, the Hall of Faith, is how it it goes all the way from the beginning, and we see even before Jesus Christ, those people that were under Abraham's seed and considered Jews, and those people like Ruth, the Moabite, yes. she would be, have been considered a Gentile. Yes. But guess what? Through her faith, she was grafted in and she became the grandmother or great grandmother, I can't remember off the top of my head, of King David. And she's also in the ancestral line of Jesus Christ. Yes, she was blessed by being in genealogy uh, coming yes. to Jesus. Very nice. And yes. So, you know, when we look at that Hebrews Hall of Faith and Rahab the prostitute, hello, Rahab the prostitute. Yes. She was there in Jericho. She was not part of the Jews that were with um, Joshua and Caleb. But because of her faith, mm -hmm. she was saved. And she is listed in the Hebrews chapter 13, Hall of Faith. Yes. It's our faith. Sister, it's our faith that makes us one. It's Jesus Christ that yeah. makes us one. And that is why we cannot say these group of people under this modern name of Israel, that they're the only ones that have to be blessed because the Rahabs and the Ruths and the others that have been grafted in because of their faith, Exactly. It's just it's special. Yes, it is discriminatory, and it also takes away for for full meaning of the gospel, where Christ wants everyone yes. blessed by coming to Him. Okay, yes. but by preaching twelve three Genesis twelve three that it applies to one little nation and to one racial group of people, that is extremely extremely wrong and it's a uh, it's, it's well it's it's, it's wrong it's wrong and it's hurtful yes. and deceptive you know to all our brothers and sisters in yes. jesus christ around the world yes. it is it, it, it it's so wrong and it's so hurtful it's somehow it's saying that this little group of people over here because of what we're telling you, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 says, this little group of people over here is somehow better than all of anybody and everybody around the world. And I heard preachers oh. out of Christian pulpits say that they're still calling them holy people. That's wrong, too, because you're not holy unless you are in Christ. That's right. You That's know? right. When, it, when, I, yeah. I, I can't remember the address, you know, how I always am. But there's a passage that says where Paul says that we are to be holy because he is holy. Yes. You know, that's what makes us holy. If we're striving to live like him, we're not holy because of where we geographically happen to reside. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's right. This is a higher meaning of the scripture, most noble meaning of the scripture. Yes. This is the truth, the truth yes. of scripture, equality and love for all that are united in Christ. You yes. see, we, we are not to be united around the state of Israel. Oh, no. we are Christians because we are united that we all love Israel. We are Christians because we all love Trump. Okay. People unite themselves around all kinds of things based on the wrongly decoded doctrines. Yeah. But we are to unite ourselves around the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and that him, will form one and him only. And which the is author and perfecter and finisher of our faith. Exactly. That's who we are supposed to be uniting around. 
And I remember, sister, when Holy Spirit showed you the truth of Genesis 12, 3, and you immediately called me. <laughs> I did, I did. Oh, no. Because remember, you, you came to our conference, and you were still a Zionist Christian, and I invited you to come to help us with conference. And, and I was talking on Noahide laws, and I was saying how Judeo-Christianity in oxymoron, because these are two opposing religions. And, uh, well, I don't want to call Christianity a religion. Jesus is not religion, right? That's right. I tell people all the time, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. Exactly. And my relationship is with Jesus Christ. My relationship is not a religion. A religion is following a certain set of rules that right. somebody has made up. Exactly. I don't follow a certain set of rules. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. So I know that uh, that was kind of shocking because you were listening to my speech on all of that. And, but, and I know that shortly after that, you went home and this is when it happened to you with Genesis 12, 3. And you called me and you said, you have no idea. Holy Spirit showed me the full meaning of Genesis 12, 3. Just, just Holy Spirit showed me. And I fully understood it now. So that was yeah. fantastic to, to get this phone call from you. And uh, I, I was so happy because that's what Holy Spirit did with me. He showed me the true meaning of scripture. Yeah. And we were able and to. And I love it when he does that. You know, I, I mean, he does it all the time. We yeah. just have to sit down with this Bible, with his word. His word. And just and let, I, him, let him do it. You know, let him do his thing. Yes, he said, ask and it shall be given. Knock and it shall be opened. So, yes, he is right there. He's as close as mention of his name. And, yes. And he's never far away from us. So that was amazing. Oh, yeah. And with all that said, we must say we love the Jewish people. We want them to come to Jesus and understand their Absolutely. Because In their fact, I think spoke of him. Yeah, I think I, 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 I'm almost positive I have told you and brother that I have a spiritual son that I led to the Lord back in the mid-1990s. He was a very close friend of my daughter's, and he came from a non-practicing Jewish family. Mm -hmm. And because he and Jessica hung around together a lot, then he started coming to church with her. And then he would come home and spend the afternoon with us on Sunday. And then I would take him back. The two of them would go back for the youth program that evening. And then I would take him home after. And his parents, you know, he wanted to go. So his parents said, sure, they didn't care, you know. Mm -hmm. But he started asking me all these questions when we were coming home from church on Sundays. And I would just answer his questions, answer his questions. And then that summer... The two of them went, their youth group had a, a week-long thing down at um, uh, Panama City Beach, you know, and I was just, I had been praying for him and praying for him, but while they were down there, I just said, I just said, Lord, make yourself real to him, and I want you to know when they got back home that uh, I found out that on the first night of their week down there in Panama City, Corey gave his life his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. Amazing. And then later when he, uh, the youth pastor baptized him, we had a ceremony and uh, I was not dressed for the occasion, but Corey insisted that I get down in the pool and hold his hand while he was baptized. Amazing. Sister. And he went on to, he, the, the Lord just, grew him in his walk and his understanding. I'm getting goosebumps telling you about this. I am getting goosebumps listening. And, um, and you know, Corey, he just grew and grew and grew. And when, after he grew up and he's a couple years older than Jessica, so he's almost 40 now, but he went into full-time ministry, youth ministry at one of the churches out east of me here in Gwinnett County. And I was so proud of him. And everybody always said, Brenda, you know, he's your son. He's your spiritual son, you know. And um, that, that is what sharing Jesus is all about. Exactly. That, 
That's the true love of the Jews, meaning we yeah. love them and we want them to know the only true yeah. Jesus Christ, their Messiah, the prophet spoke yes. about. This is how you love them when you tell them yes. about Christ. Okay? Yes. Not, not by saying, oh, you're special. You're special. We have to bless you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, we are all special. Okay. So, you know, I encourage all the people that I go to churches and, and to have pastors. If you hear them preaching doctrine wrong, please visit them. Visit them. Maybe it will help uh, to, to plant some seeds into their hearts so they can come out of the Zionist school yeah. of Christianity and come back to true Christianity, the true meaning of the scriptures, right, sister? Yes, and, 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 and I plead with people, sit down with God's holy word. Mm -hmm. Study it yourself, read it, study it yourself. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you directly. Don't expect, you know, so-and-so over there or this person over there to tell you what they want to tell you. No, let Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit, let him tell you. Because he wants to tell every single one of us. He will teach you all you need to know. Yes. And then we are united in Christ and we are one family, the church. Amen. Jew Amen. or Gentile doesn't matter because those things are gone when you're in Christ. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, status, yes. country, uh, color, race. None of that matters. And this is the most holy and most noble way we can take. So, mm -hmm. sister, I want to thank you. I don't want to make it too, too long. because and we, we had, had fun. <laughs> we can do those type of studies later, too, because I want to be with Steve now. We are going to, we have done a lot of research since coming out. And Steve uh, is in the process of writing book on fulfillment of all the feasts, Jewish feasts. They are all fulfilled in Christ, believe it or not, they're yes. all fulfilled. And prophecies that Zionist Scofield mm -hmm. Christians are applying for future, they were already fulfilled, sister. So we are going to uh, kind of bring to people and dismantle Scofieldism and, and show them how scriptures were fulfilled. I'm not saying that there is nothing that will still happen, of course. We are seeing the beast system rise right now, the beast kingdom, right. especially here. But we have Christ Jesus. That's our tool. And Christ in us and the truth of the gospel, that one has power. And Christians need to now unite around the true gospel, not around the state of Israel, not around who is the president, not around all these other distractions. We have to unite around the true gospel of Jesus. That's and right. Right. Amen. Amen, my sister. Amen. Well, that, that was Sister Brenda Jones from Georgia. <laughs> uh, you are a lot closer to me than you used to be now. So, you know, I can just go to the car and go see you anytime I want. Come on down. <laughs> yes. So, uh, thank you so much for spending time with me today. That was a lovely well, discussion. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. We're going to have to do it again. Yes, we'll do it again. Well, let's see what people want. We can talk about other subjects. You almost went into this other subject, but let's just <laughs> one subject at a time. And I was trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. We love you. You have a wonderful, blessed day. It's very sunshiny today. I know. It's, it's gorgeous. gorgeous. Y'all have a great rest of your day, too. And give my hugs to the kids. Yes, and kitties, right? Oh, and the kitties too, yeah. <laughs>